Good morning. Welcome to the CCSG overview update for the CCSG, which will be released, uh, which has been already released, I should say. Uh, it was uh, sent out on Monday, but it, the new protocols will go into effect uh, no later than July 1st of 2016. Uh, so glad you could join us today. My name is Joy Hoskins. I'm the Chief Nursing Officer for the Department for Public Health. We have a full agenda today. Um, we'll be uh, ha asking program leadership to come th uh, go through the agenda and we'll have all their PowerPoints pulled up for them to uh, provide their revisions and information uh, to you and also to provide an opportunity for any questions or answers that you may have. Please feel free to use this uh, training session, this ITV, uh, for your staff training for the CCSG changes. If you have staff who are unable to participate in today's ITV, uh, the, this session will be available via archived webcast within the next uh, uh, one to two days. So we want to make sure that you have that ready access to that information as you're training staff and you're preparing for the implementation of the new protocols. I will have uh, an additional protocol that, uh, that uh, I'll be discussing at the end of the session. It's for the intranasal naloxone, which will be a part of the appendices of the CCSG and those protocols are specifically for the school setting but as you all may know that that new the new route the intranasal route was approved by the FDA in late 2015 and so we want to make that available to uh, local health departments to share with their school partners in case the schools wanted to implement that that route of naloxone within their schools so without further ado, I'll ask Melody Stafford, who's the Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program Director, to come up and talk about her updates. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Joy. There you go. All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, hope you're having a great day already because it's a beautiful day and uh, going to be a beautiful day all day. Uh, Joy only gave me five minutes to use, and she said if she gave me any more that I might take up everybody's time. So um, I first want to thank everyone who made comments and uh, helped uh, make these changes and made us aware that there was a need for these changes. So um, the first one for the Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program is located on page 24. It's on tracking and follow-up requirements. And what we did in the first paragraph there is we uh, eliminated the wording of regardless of the patient's age, income, or insurance status. And also we added or, or removed uh, that all. We just put women there and just took out that, uh, that all. Uh, in the first paragraph, the last uh, sentence we've added an extra sentence there that said insured women with abnormal results should be referred to their primary care physician medical home for necessary follow-up and of course these are people uh, again that are insured have Medicaid um, or an MCO or whatever um, if you turn to page 27 you'll see on section B2 on the follow-up arrangements for patients with a medical home. This is to make these uh, correspond with one another. On, uh, let's see, B2, we added number uh, three to B2, which is actually number three in B3, but we eliminated B3. So what we did is eliminated B3, just moved that number three up, which says all attempts of contacts with the patient and PCP shall be documented, documented in the patient's progress notes, which is a CH3A. Uh, Joy, do you want questions after each section? Mm -hmm. yes, okay, please. so that's all we did with the Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program. Again, I appreciate all you guys do. I appreciate your input and uh, certainly uh, want you to give us that at any time throughout the year. Are there any questions at all? 
Okay, call me with any uh, questions that you might have about this change or anything about the KWCSP. Thank you all. Have a good day. Good morning, folks. This is Benita Decker, <coughs> Family Planning Program Director, and I'm just going to uh, provide you with the uh, changes uh, to the um, family planning sections of the uh, section of the CCSG. Um, it's going to look like there were a lot of changes, but really there were only just a few. Uh, um, first of all, um, we changed the um, age of screening for sexually active young um, females for chlamydia from um, less than or equal to 25 to just less than 25, which would be like 24 or younger. Um, once they're 25, um, uh, th that's, that's how they change it. And this is based on recommendations from CDC and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. They changed their recommendations, and so OPA sent us those guidelines to change for the family planning program. And so um, that's, that's a minor change, but you will um, just do chlamydia for 24 and under, or less than 25. We also added um, Luletta on page 10 to interuterine device, um, and we, uh, of the family planning clinical protocols. Um, this was just because it came available, it's covered by Medicaid, and it was not in any of our, um, um, our, our, our publications, our CCSG or anywhere, so we added it, and we also added it to our, our teaching sheets. And um, then we also, we reviewed and updated every teaching sheet. Before Christy left, Christy Royalty left, she and I went through every single teaching sheet, every single consent, and updated them. Um, and so most of them have very little changes. They were all um, fine and good. We did put um, approved dates on them to start July 1st, 2016. But um, you will go through them and not find a whole lot of changes in them. Um, we found a couple of typos and things like that. But the following are the ones that we changed that had some dramatic changes or some significant changes. And we did that both in English and Spanish. Um, First of all, as you all knew, the, know, the OMB um, approved an, a, 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 the uh, sterilization form, uh, the federal sterilization form, and uh, because the ex they didn't do any changes, they, the expiration date for it had, had happened, and so they just updated it with a new expiration date. So that has been, many of you have already gotten that, if not all of you, because we sent it out, but um, that now will be in the CCSG. Uh, both in Spanish and English. We reviewed and updated all teaching sheets. Uh, I told you that. Most consents, I'm oh, telling you what I've already told you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm reading my PowerPoint and, and not talking at the same time. Um, so um, here's the significant changes. So that the federal reports, the ACH 280 IUD insertion removal consent, we, um, we revamped that a little bit. The content's still the same, but we added a line at the very beginning that says name of IUD at the top of the page where you can insert whatever product you're using as your IUD. Um, and then, of course, the um, instruction sheet then provides all the instructions. And then also on the FPEM 10 interuterine device teaching sheet, we added the letter to the list of products um, in several places on the form. And then um, the consents and teaching, um, FP3 um, consent for insertion and other um, contraceptive implant and the FP4 for the removal of the implant. Uh, that used to say um, Nexplanon. Um, we had a, a discussion about that and, and you know, we don't know what changes are coming down the road, maybe more products or stuff. So we made it more of a generic um, uh, consent removal form where we just uh, titled it um, the insertion of the um, contraceptive implant or, and then the other one, the removal of the contraceptive implant. Um, and, and so, uh, and we also kind of changed the format of the teaching sheet um, to be more in guidelines with um, what, um, what uh, our federal partners um, have on their forms for, um, for that, for those. Do you know this, Kenny? Um, um, it just went through. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Estill okay. County, your mic is on. But... Thank you. And then on the FPM7, the contraceptive implant teaching sheet, um, we revised that completely using the Managing Contraceptives Pocket Guide. Um, and, and of course, that's also kind of reflective on the um, consents removal and insertion also. So the main changes in the teaching sheets are to the implant forms. Um, here's the, what the form looks like. 
um, for the teaching sheet on the contraceptive implant. Um, and then really that's about it. Um, please use, because of the revision dates on all the um, sheets, please um, print out new consent forms and teaching sheets and dispose of your old forms um, and so that you have the most revised um, um, approval dates and things like that on your sheets as you go forward and I appreciate that. Um, and I thank you for listening to me. Um, do you have any questions about this? Danita, this is Marcy in Bullock County. Hi, Marcy. Hi. Uh, do you have, did you send that by chance, your, your PowerPoint? With, uh, um, I know Melody had, like, when she's, for her update, she had sent just just those updates on on a separate listing and that would be helpful if we would if we could get a copy of that unless you already did and i just haven't seen it we marcy this is joy we the powerpoints are the list of the changes that were made and so for the forms though the forms will be posted in the forms and teaching sheet section of the ccsg would that would it be helpful for us to go ahead and send out all of the um revised forms for you all and teaching sheets not the forms themselves i'm talking about what she was taught the, the listing of those changes just the changes we yeah that those are yeah. yeah the only thing that really i mean all the forms got changed with a revision date or actually an approval date saying that we have looked through those forms and approved them the only ones with the significant changes are the ones i said but i can send we can send that out yeah so i can send that thank to you, you. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there's any other questions. Is there any other questions? All right. Thank you all. <clears throat> Dr. White, would you like to come and say hi to the group? Dr. White. Deputy Commissioner for the Pu Department for Public Health has joined us and uh, I'd like to invite her to come forward and say a few words. So she would. Thank you, Dr. White, for coming joining us. Yes, by no means am I going to do the lab section changes. <laughs> I did uh, work my way through college. Uh, I I'm looking at the screen here and that's what's coming up next. I did work my way through college as a phlebotomist. So uh, that is as close to being a lab person as I probably ever could want to think about getting. So thank you so much for all of you that joined us this morning. We're so glad that, that we're able to, to do this update. I think this is very helpful. I think the PowerPoints are helpful. I think the communication is helpful. But we still need to know from you what is it that we need to do to make this a more helpful experience for you. Uh, so please, I know people, uh, you know, you, you say, gosh, I just don't know why they in Frankfurt. They just don't do this. Well, probably because we haven't thought of it. So if you've thought of something that will make the system go more efficiently, more streamlined for you, please let us know. Because we definitely want this to be something that is as seamless as possible. Changes are, uh, are never good. Someone says nobody likes change but a baby. And since I have a new four-month-old, mm -hmm. uh, and I love those new diapers with the blue line on them. Have you <laughs> seen those things? I mean, that's amazing. that it, They tell you when they're dirty. You know, stick your hand down in there. It's great. Uh, so uh, we, we, want, we want to change. If you, so there, there's a blue line we need to know about. You need to let us know so we can make this more efficient. So I won't be taking any more of your time. Thank you. Thanks to the audience that's here today. And thank you all for being on the call. Please let us know any ways that we can help. Thank you, Dr. White. <coughs> Next, we have Robin Cotton, who is with the uh, lab DLS. And so she's going to be reviewing the changes uh, for the laboratory section. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Use the clicker bicker here to go forward. Uh -huh. Okay. Hello, my name is Robin Cotton, and I'm welcoming everyone here and glad that you can uh, join us. So the laboratory section is very small, and basically before it was a table of contents, and then it had a chart, and on that chart there was lab tests and procedures, um, reference ranges, and then guidelines. So this year when we looked at it, we felt necessary that we wanted to place a little bit of an explanation or interpretation and have an overview instead of just here's a table of contents, here's a chart, you know, have at it. 
because uh, we felt like there would be different professionals looking at it, so we wanted to pro provide a little bit more intense overview. Okay, so what's in the overview of the laboratory testing, and obviously that's going to change the page numbers, so just be aware of that. Uh, we wanted to have three short paragraphs just to explain what laboratory testing provides. Um, a little bit about the reference ranges and values and why they, va uh, they may vary from lab to lab. And then a little bit about the national laboratory references. And then obviously give you a little bit more information on our contact. Because I believe there was maybe a phone number and not the website. And I really want to encourage you all to go to the website because there's a plethora of information on packaging, shipping, contents, and um, just uh, how to collect things. So you'll find that very useful. Okay, so in the overview, obviously, there's going to be a lot of different people looking at this. So first up, we make uh, uh, a statement that I think most of us understand that, you know, we're talking about laboratory tests, obviously, that involves testing of different things, body fluids, you know, blood, urine, and other tissues, and secretions and substances. That does make a difference if I'm talking about, you know, a value on a finger stick glucose as opposed to venous, you know, the sources are important because those labs will, will vary. So, you know, we're just, you know, calling your attention to that. Also, we want to make you aware that laboratory tests um, provide clinicians and health providers with clues. These are just indicators. Rock Castle County, your mic is open. Go ahead. Okay. So when we're looking at these laboratory tests, um, we just want to make you aware that these are basically indicators. This is not an end-all, a be-all, um, especially as you know when you're doing your point-of-care testing. You know, that's a good, red, something pops up, it's an abnormal, you're going to move on to further testing. Also, I think that we all know that with the laboratory test that it helps identify, you know, changes in health conditions, diagnose diseases, plan treatment for disease, uh, evaluate treatment, and help monitor diseases and conditions over time. This is a very valuable service that you're providing and we really appreciate that because we're going to talk a little bit about why there's some changes on the chart and what DLS is moving to. So we're really counting on you as a front line and doing those laboratory tests. So we really appreciate that. Okay, so when you're looking at this chart, we wanted to kind of make you aware, um, when you're looking at a reference range um, of what is what we call quote, quote, considered normal, that you have to think in the back of your mind that, you know, this is based on healthy people. And what they've done is, you know, if you look at the whole entire United States, it's going to vary from, you know, region to region um, by age, sex, um, ethnicity, race, and different things like that. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, it's going to vary slightly from lab to lab uh, of what test is being done. Uh, one health department might use a point of care testing piece of equipment for hemoglobin A1C that's a little different from another. So their reference range might be, I'm not, I can't remember off head, it might be 4.1 to 6.0. The other one might be 4.5 to 6.5. So when you look at these reference range, uh, ranges on the chart, we just want to make you aware these are not set in stone. They're indicators, but they're very good indicators. Okay, many national public health organizations have put out these statistics. Um, what we have done is use those because they're very good because they're national and it gives you a really good idea of where you should be. Um, we've put a little bit more national um, references in there like Mayo Clinic. So when you look at different ones, like if you pull up something from Mayo Clinic and you pull up something from John Hopkins, you will know that there's a little variance because of the reference ranges in the population. Okay, moving on. Oops click the wrong thing there we go okay um, one of the things uh, that you'll notice in the CCSG I keep wanting to call it specimen because of the lab instead of service so in the, in the CCSG um, that we did provide our website and please click it on because it is a comprehensive list of what we do information packaging mm -hmm. shipping and collection 
Okay, so what was the difference about the, uh, the chart? You will notice that there's a little bit of difference in the chart this year. Um, first of all, when I sat down with the management, we kind of wanted to make it clear because it kind of gives a false impress impression that all those tests in the chart were performing at DLS and were not. Um, everything that is double asterisk now denotes tests that we are not providing. Okay, and that's important to know that. Um, a lot of those tests are clinical, and a lot of them you are performing as the front line. Uh, the DLS, as you know, at one time did a lot of those, you know, the lipids and the glucose. But with the emerging um, pathogens that are coming on board, the lab is moving more towards surveillance. Um, we're taking on uh, things like Ebola and Zika and MERS and anything that latest that comes on. So we just wanted to make that clear so that if you call us and, and ask us about lipids or glucose, we can give you some guidance, but we don't perform those tests. So we want to make that clear. Also, we wanted to also put the word recommendations in the follow-up guidelines because those are what they are recommendations and guidelines. We're not saying this is exactly what you need to do, but they're great recommendations and guidelines. There's a lot of people who put a lot of work in that to tell you to go to this section to look about blood, this section to look at HIV and different things. Also, we put a lot more national references. One of the exciting things at first, I have to admit I wasn't excited when I was volunteer to do the CCSG changes, <laughs> But I learned a lot because I, when I was looking at it and I was looking at these ranges and I was getting on different sites, that's how I, would, you know, I was noticing the different you know, changes, uh, you know, why this, this range was different like from John Hopkins and Mayo. But when I clicked on those different websites, they had a plethora of information. So like use these websites because they talk a lot more in depth and you could possibly use them to educate your clientele. Mayo Clinic and CDC and um, um, John Hopkins, they have one for American Diabetes Association. Great information that you, you know, if uh, most people have a computer at home, you can tell them, go, you know, to these websites, learn a little bit about, a little bit more about those conditions. So we enhance that. Um, we also put a little statement in there uh, on the wave po uh, point of care testing to make that noted that this test is like hemoglobin A1C, we don't do it, um, that it's done by usually you are all um, local health departments and health care provider. Also we added underneath disorders, these are new tests at DLS, don't ask me what they do because I'm not in newborn screening, I'm sorry but you can call them and discuss that with them. The new one, obviously, is Skib and Crab A. I think that's Pompey, and I'm not even sure what MPS-1 is. But our newborn screening is, I mean, it is just um, growing by leaps and uh, uh, bounds. And that's wonderful because we can, uh, we can um, you know, encounter any genetic disorder. We're one of the leaders uh, of the nation. I don't know if you know that in newborn screening. So that's wonderful we've taken that on. And also, um, Leanne looked over the packaging and shipping. She's our guru, Leanne Bates. And she felt like that, you know, this wasn't the greatest place to put packaging and shipping information, go to the administrative references. So you will see that, remove from that, and go to your administrative reference on that. And is that it? Wow, that is... It so do I have any questions at all? Can you give us an update on when package and shipping training? <laughs> I know you were going to ask that. I have asked Leanne that because she's our guru. Um, and has she responded back to you at all? Excuse me, Frankfurt, you're sitting on black video right oh, now. Sorry. Yeah, did she, did Leanne get back with you? Because a couple of people had asked me and I referred her on, on to Leanne. No, she has not gotten back with Okay, Brad. I know she's setting them up right now. And we have a module on train. And I believe that's what she's moving toward. But I need to talk to her because that's what uh, one of her main functions is. 
is the packaging and shipping. So I will ask her again today about that. But we just all at DLS did it, and it's online uh, on train. So I'll ask her if she is intending for you all to do that train module and how she's going to manage that. That would be perfect. We just need to know what we're supposed to do. Okay. Also, um, real quickly, a shout out. I see that Lawrence County is on, and there might be a few. Ashland Boyd, uh, if you missed the last ITV, you do not have to send your record changes, your record searches anymore to the DLS. That is a change that the FLOC program is going through. So keep them for your records. We're trusting you to do uh, QA, but what we would like to continue to have is your QA minutes and any meetings so that we know what's going on in your health department and we can give you guidance on any of those things. So go ahead and keep that because to be honest, we're not getting maybe 25% of, of the health department submitting those. Those that have been doing it have been doing a great job we appreciate it so just go ahead and hang on to them for your review and for your health department anything else okay thank you so much appreciate it have a wonderful day it's great thank you robin uh, i wanted to take this opportunity to also thank the nurse executive committee for their time and efforts reviewing the CCSG changes after they were submitted and before they went to Dr. White for her approval. One of the uh, good uh, healthy conversations and dialogues that we had uh, with the NEC and Robin was the conversation about the lab section and the references and those ranges. And so I think that we came to a, a, a general consensus about about the information that is included in that section. So I wanted to thank Robin and Liam Bates for their time and efforts on, on those revisions. Next we have, let's see here, it looks like Sherry White with the STD program. Yeah, yeah. Come on up, Sherry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sherry, for coming today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, to get this to move forward, just click on it. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, well, good morning. My name is Sherry White. I'm the assistant manager for the STD program. And we have uh, submitted several changes to our section. Um, but really, it, it only, most of the changes relate to one disease and those were changes to the gonorrhea uh, treatment guidelines. These updates were implemented because CDC updated their guidelines in June of 2015. And like I said, the major change is to the, for the treatment of gonorrhea due to the development of antimicrobial resistance. So um, going forward, the treatment re recommendations for gonorrhea is 250 milligrams of ceftrioxone, IM, in combination with azithromycin, one gram. Um, there are also additions to the CCSG in regards to alternative treatments for uncomplicated urogenital gonorrhea in persons with a subosporin allergy. Uh, we've also added retesting to detect repeat gonorrhea infections. Uh, there are updates to chlamydia treatment in pregnancy. There are recommendations for um, hep C screening. Uh, treatment updates for the treatment of genital warts, and there's a few minor changes to PID, epididymitis, and candida. Um, there are several other changes, but they're very basic, so we really don't need to go over them, but they are to the footnotes of each uh, disease section uh, so that it is in line with uh, uh, 2015 CDC treatment guidelines, so you can easily look them up. Um, so page three is our first change, and this is where we're adding uh, um, hepatitis C screening guidelines, as well as including uh, um, to obtain oral specimens in addition, or blood specimens or oral specimens for HIV testing. Um, a lot of health departments are already doing that, so we just wanted to add it to be consistent to what is actually occurring out in the local health departments. 
And then down at the, uh, towards the bottom is the guidance for including hepatitis C uh, screening. Um, so please refer to the HCV Matrix 1 collection, collection and handling guidance and HCV Matrix 2 screening and referral guidance. Um, so like I said before, uh, for SCD gonococcal infections, uh, for uncomplicated gonococcal infections of the cervix, urethra, and rectum, uh, the recommended treatment is now ceftrioxone, 250 milligrams as a single intramuscular dose, plus the zithromycin, one gram orally. As an alternative, if ceftrioxone is not available, cefixin, 400 milligrams, plus azithromycin, one gram, is acceptable. Okay. Um, page 10. Uh, the first change, uh, gonococcal infections, is exactly we removed the box that said adequate treatment for chlamydia infection, and now the wording is, is exactly one gram of zithromycin. Um, and then there's also ceftriaxone and azithromycin should be administered together on the same day, preferably <coughs> simultaneously. So, for example, if you're providing uh, empiric treatment because someone has symptoms of chlamydia and on the exam day, you're going to provide a gram of azithromycin, but when you get the lab results come back and they are now infected with gonorrhea, when they come back in, uh, ideally you should go ahead and treat with the ceftriaxone plus the azithromycin at that time. Oops, sorry. Wait. Okay. Um, and the reasons for the uh, changes in the GC treatment, uh, for the dual treatment, is that it's believed that it will enhance the treatment effectiveness and it will prevent the transmission of resistant organisms. Azithromycin is preferred over doxycycline due to high prevalence of tetracycline resistance. In 2013, uh, tetracycline resistance was at 23.7%, whereas azithromycin was only like 1%. Um, there is no clinical data to support increasing dose of ceftrioxone or azithromycin as part of dual therapy. Uh, ceftrioxone treatment failure is rare. Um, the only instances of treatment failure are out, all outside the United States. Um, azithromycin monotherapy, meaning two grams of azithromycin, are no longer recommended due to the ease of resistance. And a test of cure is not needed after treatment for your genital or rectal infection. However, it is recommended for uh, pharyngeal infections if an alternative treatment is used. Uh, page 10, the alternatives for gonorrhea infections. Um, this is where, uh, under the heading of alternatives, we removed the two grams of azithromycin. Um, and then we removed that box that you're so used to seeing, and then we just added it, cefixin, 400 milligrams orally in a single dose, plus azithromycin, one gram orally in a single dose. Um, page 10 again. Under special considerations, if someone is allergic to azithromycin, doxycycline, 100 milligrams, BID, for seven days, may be used as a second antimicrobial. Uh, for a cephalosporin or IgE-mediated penicillin allergy, consult an infectious disease specialist. However, some of the potential options are uh, gemofloxin, 320 milligrams orally in a single dose, plus two grams of azithromycin in a single dose, or gentamicin, 200, 240 milligrams IM, plus two grams of azithromycin in a single dose. This is just as a reference, uh, so uh, folks can see the outcome of the uh, studies that were done. Uh, it seems to be very effective. Um, for um, gentamicin and azithromycin combination, they had a 100% um, uh, treatment rate. Uh, the, in parentheses, that is a confidence interval of 98.5%. They had limited um, uh, participants for the pharyngeal or rectal infection. So there, I think it looks good, but they're still trying to do more studies on those. Um, page 10 again. Gonococcal infections under the heading of test. We want to add men and women who have been treated for gonorrhea should be retested three months after treatment or whenever they next present for medical care within 12 months of initial treatment. 
This is the same language that's in the chlamydia section, so we'll be very consistent. Page 11, gonococcal infections under heading GC Fernix. The recommended treatment, we want to remove that box and we want to add in plus azithromycin, one gram orally in a single dose. Page 11 again. Uh, gonococcal infections under the heading Pharynx alternatives. We're going to remove ciprofloxin, 500 milligrams orally in a single dose, and that is due to the penicillin resistance that is out, that is above 5%. Um, we're going to remove the box and we're going to add in cephalosporins or IgE mediated penicillin allergy, consult an infectious disease specialist. And then below that, if anyone receives an alternative regimen for pharyngeal, uh, GC, they need to have a test to cure. NATS is okay, 14 days after completion of therapy. Uh, page 12, gonococcal infections, under heading GC in children. Uh, we are changing the language to be more consistent with what is in the treatment guidelines. Um, so we are um, removing what was there and then adding back ceftrioxone 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram IV or IM in a single dose not to exceed the 125 milligrams IM. Page 13, gonococcal infections under the heading of GC pregnancy recommended treatment remove the following. Uh, Cefixin 400 milligrams orally in a single dose and we're going to remove that box, and then we're going to add um, plus azithromycin one gram orally in a single dose. So basically, we're just removing the suffixum and uh, changing the language. Page 13 again, gonococcal infections, GC pregnancy alternatives, remove the following, azithromycin two grams orally in a single dose, and we're going to remove the box. And then we're going to add in when cephalosporin allergy or other considerations preclude treatment with a recommended regimen, consult consultation with an infectious disease specialist is recommended. Uh, page 15, chlamydial infections, uh, chlamydia in pregnancy, recommended treatment. We're going to remove amoxicillin 500 milligrams and it was demoted to an alternative. So we just moved it over. Um, and the reasons for removing the amoxicillin is that in, in vitro studies demonstrate penicillin induces persistent viable non-infectious chlamydia that can revert to a re replicative form after penicillin removal. And early amoxicillin studies that had been done in pregnancy had some major limitations and basically um, other like azithromycin had a higher test of cure rate. Uh, SCD epididymitis, page 19, under the heading of alternatives. At the top of the column, we want to add in ceftrioxone 250 milligrams IM in a single dose. Uh, plus, towards the bottom of the column, for acute epididymitis, most likely caused by sexually transmitted chlamydia and gonorrhea and enteric organisms, um, and then men who practice assertive anal sex. So, since this is really intended for STD visits, we wanted to um, add this in. We thought it would be beneficial. What was there before was for just enteric organisms, so. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease, page 20. Um, under recommended treatment and alternatives, we're gonna remove some old language, language that was in there, regimen A and regimen B. Um, and for column under alternatives. <laughs> Could y'all check your mics, please? Someone has their mic open. Thank you. So we're going to remove ceftrioxone 250 milligrams IM and the two grams of azithromycin. Okay, Candida, page 23. Uh, under recommended treatment, we're going to we're changing the language. So, um, so we're going to remove Terazol seven, and we're going to add back in what's actually in the treatment guidelines, and that's the Terconazol uh, 0.4 percent vaginal cream and five grams of intravaginally daily for seven days. 
And under Candida Alternatives, we're going to remove the Femstat vaginal cream and add back in what is actually in the treatment guidelines, which is uh, butoconazole cream. Uh, HPV, page 24. Uh, under recommended treatment, we're going to remove the Podophyllin resin. It's no longer recommended uh, due to the number of safer treatment options that are out there. We're also going to, under the symptoms of HPV, we're going to modify uh, the paragraph where it says genital wards can proliferate and become friable during pregnancy. Many specialists advocate their removal during pregnancy. Um, and HPV type 6 and 11 can cause respiratory uh, pelomatosis in infants and children. And we're going to change it because there's been a shift over time in the philosophy at CDC and they're based on studies that have been done. So we're actually changing the wording uh, to genital warts can proliferate and become friable during pregnancy. Although removal of warts during pregnancy can be considered, resolution might be incomplete or poor until pregnancy is complete. Um, and then APV type 6 and 11 rarely can cause respiratory pelomatosis in infants and children. Page 29, and this is our last slide, and this is just a um, a little promotion for the uh, STD app. They're actually available uh, via iTunes in the App Store. They're very quick and easy to use, uh, so we thought that would be a great resource for y'all to have. Any questions? Okay, no questions? Okay, thank you everyone, I appreciate it. This is Clark County. I do have a question, oh. please. Oh. <laughs> um, are, are those medicines going to be provided through the state, the alternatives? Um, if you're the talking new medicines? for gonorrhea, the gemifloxin and the gentamicin, yes. those two drugs we're looking at, uh, when I first looked at it, they were cost prohibitive because we very we don't have situations where folks who are allergic to cephalosporins often. Uh, but we are going to look into that and see what we can do. The other drugs, I mean, we do provide the bison, we do provide the, the doxy, the azithromycin, um, the ceftrioxone. As far as medications for HPV, no, we don't provide that. Um, there are some things in there that, that we do not. Any other questions? Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Sharon, you want to leave those copies up front? Nobody wants to. <laughs> thank you, Sherry. Anything else? Jane, would you like to say something? No, I think she said her mouth full already. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, the STD, the STD program. Next, we'll have. But I do want to. I'm sorry. I do want to make yes, a statement. Sir. Sherry has done an outstanding job over the years making those changes and modifications. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry and Jay. Next, we'll have Gail Yoakum from the HIV program to present the changes for the HIV chapter. Thank you, Gail, for being with us today. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning and appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, share with you just some minor changes that we have in the CCSG. Um, the serial conversion period has been changed from six months to three months and that's largely due to improvements in the HIV antibody tests that are now available. References to the Western blot have been changed to confirmatory testing uh, because the Western blot is um, really falling out of favor with the CDC and is being replaced by several other types. We've added discussion of syringe availability um, since programs are now legal in Kentucky and health departments have the option to uh, work with their local governments to implement syringe exchange and 
I applaud all of you who have made efforts in this area and have been successful with the syringe exchange. I think it's going to chase, uh, really change the face of public health. Also, specific training courses for the rapid HIV test have links provided to train and um, this was in response to um, staff at local health departments um, expressing concerns for the length of the uh, HIV training. It was initially four days and took you out of the clinic for uh, way too long. And uh, kudos to Greg Lee, our Director of Education, who in a very short period of time got the modules on train, he worked very closely with the folks in train who were very helpful in moving that through quickly and now there's just a one day skill building. So uh, thank you for your input for that and for letting us know that that was a hardship for you and thanks to Greg for his responsiveness. And then lastly, the names for the surveillance staff have been updated. Um, so you have the most current list of the people who are involved. And just um, to end the, the session here, I wanted to let you know that we appreciate your efforts with HIV testing. HIV is on the rise, unfortunately, especially in uh, young adults and uh, everything that you do to increase awareness in your communities is greatly appreciated. We are in the process of working with the state lab and looking at a couple of new tests that have higher sens sensitivity and specificity because we always want to have the best tests for our uh, clients and patients and for our medical providers. Uh, the brown bag program is continuing, so if you need condoms for your health departments, you can contact Tracy Foster with the STD program and she will arrange to get those to you. Um, let's see. Um, in regard to ordering your test kits, the reps from Orishore and Alir reach out to your staff or your designated contact person on a quarterly basis to inquire about your inventory and your current needs. So when those emails come from Emma Randazzo and Pam Pitts, um, please take a moment to respond to those because that's how you get your test kits. So thanks everybody for all you do. Oh, I'm sorry, any questions? Gail. Next we have Emily Anderson who is the program director for the TB program. Thank you Emily for being with us today. Thank you Ms. Joy. Good morning everyone out in TB land. I've got to put my little cheaters on so I apologize here. Okay so for the TB section um, we had just some minimal changes. We added a couple of items and then we we deleted some from the the content but added them to the form section so we kind of trimmed the fat down just a little bit so to speak um first off your table of contents will change um so those page numbers will be a little different so you might want to just take a look at that i won't go over that um <clears throat> on page five of the matrix in the follow-up column which is the far right column we added a bullet to let you know, yes, for video dot protocols, see page 19. We just realized that we didn't have that in the matrix. So that's just a little um, bullet added for your convenience. Next, we created a new page 19. <laughs> so <laughs> added some um, content to that. And what we did, it's not new information, we took the video dot information from your TB teaching sheet, TB14, and just added that content, that directional content, to page 19. So it's not anything new. We took the word video phone because really we're not using those antiquated phones anymore. 
um, for video dot everyone seems to be across the state using either FaceTime or Skyping and not those old landline phones that we had with the TV program that we would ship out to you and you would borrow from time to time so we took the word video phone and just said video changing with the times and let's see and that was at um, pretty much the local health department request we had had several local health departments call in and say you know we're having to go to the teaching sheet to find actual directional information on how we need to or protocol information for the video dot so we listened and, and added that back in there for you next moving right along um, page 35 and this was, <coughs> excuse me, this page was moved. This was the uh, decision tree, uh, decision to initiate a TB contact investigation. We um, felt like that um, some of these algorithms that really aren't, um, that's more informative for you, it's, it's kind of helping. We just actually moved this to a form section and, and um, gave it a title TB27. So it's, it comes out of your core content and goes to being a form now. And that was just kind of keeping with the true spirit of the section um, and trying to get forms lined up in, in the correct section and everything. Now next, um, we did add some information, and again, this was at um, several local health department requests, and that's, that's pretty much how we do things. When we see that there's a trend, we put that in our memory bank and say, okay, we need to update this into the section, and that's what we did. Um, and this is information planning a contact investigation. And we took this information, it's not new information at all, it's from the core curriculum TV guidelines from CDC, and it's from directly lifted from those CDC um, training modules that are prerequisites to becoming a TV coordinator. So again, it's no new information, we just lifted it, but we felt like um, in, in honor of the request from the health departments that that protocol information was added to here. So I'd like to just kind of just highlight just a few of that information. Um, in the second paragraph, don't forget, when do you begin a contact investigation? It's for those individuals when you have a suspect um, before you even have confirmation, because remember gold standard of course is um, uh, dispute of culture and that takes six weeks. So before you have that confirmation, you should begin your uh, contact investigation. And um, if you have a negative sputum smear, uh, you can go ahead and start that if you, the contact investigation, if you do have um, abnormal chest x-ray. So remember, all of that clinical data is starting to paint that picture, right, for a true TB suspect. And then if you have a negative sputum smear, no abnormal chest x-ray, no pulmonary cavities, um, but you have a contact and you feel like there's some certain circumstances and this is where your clinical judgment comes in and you feel that that suspect was identified either in an outbreak or it's been identified as a source case, um, then you can go ahead and start uh, your contact investigation. And then if later you determine that that suspect case does not have TB disease, you can abrupt that, or you know, abort that contact investigation now here's the here's where we're getting some questions out in the field and it's pretty much from some of our newer tb coordinators that don't have as many suspects or cases but i just wanted to highlight that and that is if you have a person with extra pulmonary disease remember they're not usually infectious um, but they also could have pulmonary disease right so you got to rule out pulmonary disease don't ever forget that but you've noted that the extra pulmonary disease is in the oral cavity or in the larynx, or the extra pulmonary disease uh, includes an open abscess, such as a scrofula or a lesion, and the concentration of organisms has been determined very high, then you should always, always, always rule out pulmonary disease. Always, so you're gonna collect those sputums, you're gonna try, okay? So don't forget that. And remember, if you have noted that there's um, 
a contact investigation that's going to be greater than 10 people that's kind of the rule of thumb always contact our program um, for additional guidelines and assistance pretty much everyone out in the state does a, a, a great job doing this and we pretty much know there's going to be a contact investigation the day you report it to us so kudos to everyone you do a fabulous job but I gave those resources um, for you that you can have uh, additional information from the MMWR. And don't forget, we've added in those goals of a contact investigation. And again, this was content that was not new. It was lifted straight from the core, uh, core guidance and um, the core curriculum and the CDC self-study self modules that everyone is a prerequisite to being a coordinator. I'm gonna move on. We um, actually identified several pages, 40 through 43, that we felt like, again, was more um, form related and not necessarily a, a protocol. For instance, it's just helpful hints on how to prioritize your contacts. Um, you know, we talk about the concentric circles and high, medium, and low, documentation for reporting. Uh, and again, that concentric circle approach, we just felt like that that was just additional information and uh, is helpful hints. So we just um, added that to the form section. And let's see, make sure I didn't miss something there. Oh, and also um, we deleted some information. We felt like that while you still have to complete um, your contact investigation rosters, that's very, very important, and we actually review that on site visits. Um, however, you don't have to send that always within that first month to the state like it's always been. Uh, you just send in your contact investigation summary sheet at the end of your contact investigation. And you know we don't have um, availability to house or store all of those contact investigation rosters. Um, but we do request them from time to time so know that you still must complete them and it would be a requirement in your site visit review from either the program or CDC. And we are seeing that out. Um, CDC has resumed their site visits and request for um, chart reviews. We've actually seen that in the last month from CDC. So we made a few little changes. We trimmed the fat down, so to speak, in the section, but moved them over to forms, so you'll still have access to that important information. Does anyone have any questions for me? Okay, sounds good. Thank you all. Thanks, Ms. Joy. Thank you, Emily. I think somebody's going to ask a question. Does someone have a question for Emily? Sorry to interrupt, but Frankfurt audio and visual is not coming through to Woodford County. Okay. If they can call the... It's an issue at Woodford County. You are transmitting. Oh, okay. All right. Woodford, can you call... Um, let me see here what that number is. Yeah, thank you, Emily. 502 564 one but she probably needs to reboot her codec. Okay. Thank you, Rex. Did you all hear that, Woodford? I think they had it live. Okay. Emily, just as a FYI, we didn't get a chance to talk um, before, but um, just for the field as well, we'll be adding the new forms TB. Form 27 and TB Form 28 mm -hmm. to the forms listing of the CCSG. So that's where they'll find that information. Great. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're waiting on our next speaker to come. So I've sent out the cavalry for her. Um, and so in the meantime, I'll go ahead, if it's all right, and do, do uh, the intranasal naloxone, Casey. We'll go a little bit out of order here <coughs> while we're waiting for our next presenter. Okay, thank you. As I mentioned at the beginning of the press, uh, beginning of our ITV, uh, the FDA did approve the new route for naloxone for, uh, for uh, via the intranasal route. And so I just wanted to share that this information with you all. This guidance will be in the CCSG under the appendices section at the bottom of the 
table of contents under appendices B. Um, so now we will have two naloxone protocols, one for auto injector and one for the intranasal route. And in accordance with um, Senate Bill 192, which was passed last March in 2015, schools have the option to uh, maintain uh, uh, two doses uh, to, in two, excuse me, in two different sites uh, in their, within their school naloxone. And so some school districts may choose to uh, have either the auto injector or the intranasal or perhaps both. I do know that um, ADAPT Pharma is working with local health, excuse me, with school, high schools across the state uh, to provide intranasal naloxone free of charge. So that initiative is rolling out, uh, I believe, for the upcoming school year. So we wanted to make sure that these protocols were available for uh, schools. <clears throat> Um, I think I've said everything. Hi, Nancy. I think we've said everything. Um, what I did was on the on the intranasal protocol, just FYI, I updated the uh, statute, the KRS um, that was uh, for Senate Bill 192. Um, I deleted the references for the auto injector from the existing protocol, um, left in the information about opioid uh, addiction, signs and symptoms of an overdose, uh, and rescue breathing, and then I simply cut and pasted the uh, administration for intranasal naloxone directly from the package insert from the, from the uh, drug manufacturer. So that's what you'll see um, <clears throat> in that protocol. So um, Dr. White has that information and she's reviewing that it has been sent out what excuse me it was sent out um, KDE did provide some uh, input on the protocol so I wanted to make sure that you all knew that KDE was involved in uh, in the development of the protocol and then uh, I hope to send that out today for you all and then you can share that if you would with your school partners um, school health nurses in some situations you all provide the school health services and you would have that direct contact um, in other situations I know that some local health departments um, have a, a different contractual relationship or they may not have a, um, a, a contract or uh, another type of uh, relationship but they would still want to go ahead and and share this information with your school partners if you would if you have any questions about the protocol, again, it's very similar to the auto injector protocol, and I'll get that out to you all uh, today. But if you have any questions, please contact me or Susan Lawson, who is the Well Child School Health uh, Program Coordinator, and we'll be glad to assist you with that information. Thank you. Okay, so Kathy Sanders is next for hepatitis C. Thanks, Kathy. We'll go ahead and ask you to come on up. Okay. Kathy Sanders, there you go. We'll get your PowerPoint pulled up for you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me here. And as you know, um, in December, we added um, our core clinical to the CCSG, the Hepatitis C Local Health Department testing guidance. And so, if anyone has any questions about that clinical guidance, please feel free to ask. But in the meantime, since January, there were a couple additions, a couple of changes that were made to that guidance. Do I need to pull it or do you? Okay, there we go. Okay. And so on page 18, which would be the form HCV2, we made some changes. Um, to that risk assessment because we wanted to make sure there were two forms and we wanted to make sure that both forms had everything and you know we were able to collect the data for you all to be able to report and so we added in what country were you born because we would like to obviously track that data um, and then multiple sex partners is there a history of multiple sexual partners in these individuals that you are screening because if these individuals report any of these activities, these would be individuals that would be high risk and we would recommend that you would provide uh, the hepatitis C screening to, the testing to. And then we added HIV infection before it was 
just, you know, HIV infection was on there, but there wasn't a place for you to put yes, no, we're not sure. And so we felt like that we needed to be able to track that information to look at the HIV hep C co-infection so we could have that data. And then obviously then the, then the next one on this would be recent exposure to the hepatitis C uh, virus. And we added not sure because some individuals, you know, you may not know it, we didn't want it blank, and so we left, we added not sure to that. Then we made um, on the testing log, and so we'll go to the next slide. And this is the log that you, um, that the local health department nurses that you track and that you and every month should be sending in this form. And so the testing log, we added a new format that was recommended by Jennifer Hunter and her team at Northern Kentucky Independent Health Department. And so it is a little bit different format. And we added date of birth. And then we also added on that form the rapid hepatitis C test results if you are in the field. And remember, we only recommend that the rapid hepatitis C test be done off-site in the field, such as syringe exchange programs. But we added a place for the rapid hepatitis C test results to be put on that form. And please keep in mind that if you are providing the rapid that you need to be able to um, provide the antibody test. You need to be able to have someone that's going to be able to draw that blood test. And then you're going to need to be able to go on and send that to uh, the state lab. And then they will forward on for RNA confirmation if that's needed. So that is the only changes that were that was made um, since January uh, to the guidance. Does anybody have any questions? Kathy, this is Dorothy in the Purchase District. Yes. Good morning. I um, I may have missed that, or or has it not been uh, mentioned which countries do put you at high risk of Hep C? Um, we did not <coughs> mention that. I can look that up, but certainly, you know, some of in, in Europe, those countries are very high risk. India. You know, Israel, many of these countries are higher risk for the hepatitis C and, uh, and virus simply because of, you know, poor, uh, re, you know, reuse of uh, syringes and during medical procedures has been really um, a hot topic or, or, you know, of concern in many of these countries. If you like, I can get you a list. Uh, I can send that out uh, to the local health department directors or I can even put that in an upcoming newsletter. That would be great, especially okay. if, if that's going to be a deciding factor for testing. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? We really appreciate local health department efforts in assisting us with um, doing this testing. As we know, you know, Kentucky, we are, you know, ranked highest in the U.S. with our hepatitis C rates. We are seeing, you know, epidemic in particular in our younger, you know, 20 to 35 years of age, um, in particular with our, you know, our drug and injection drug use, we are seeing a very high percentage. So I really appreciate, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to call me and we will assist you in any way that we can. And then please keep in mind that we are, that we do have, you know, last February it became mandated for all um, mothers, um, pregnant women with hepatitis C virus, as well as children born to mothers or infants born to mothers with hepatitis C, as well as children under the age of five. And you can use that EPID 394 form to report that. We are getting reports um, from hospitals, Coast Airs hospitals, where we're, we're receiving a lot of reports. Please understand that the infants born to mothers we just want them reported. We cannot do any testing on these children. You can do the rapid at two to four months of age, and we're recommending that that can be done at their two or four month well child check. But if someone wants to do the antibody, that antibody needs to be done after 18 months of age. 
because otherwise if it's done sooner, it can detect the mother's um, maternal antibodies in that infant and that test is not, you know, it's, it's useless. It's not anything of value and we are getting those reports. So does anybody have any questions about that? Hi, this is Sheila Clark County Health Department. To go back to the um, risk assessment form for the patients okay. and, comparing it, and comparing it to the information log, you're asking on the information log if they have tattoos, yes or no, and if yes, if they're professional or homemade. <coughs> on the risk assessment to the patient, you're only asking if they have non-professional uh, tattoos, so we still have to revisit that with them. Okay. So, Typically, if I mean, they're, they're really concerned about the individuals that are not that they're not a professional regulated salon. You know, we're having a lot of self tattoos. We're getting reports of high school students. You know, people you know sharing people ordering kits on Amazon and the whole family or friends getting together and them all doing tattoos. So that's our biggest concern. You know, the inmates and incarceration. You know, those tattoos that people you know got that we're not in regulated um in regular regulated regulated facilities is our biggest concern but i see what you're saying and, and we can add that and we'll be you know but obviously i guess that would be next year no no we can do it now okay, okay. <coughs> if you see that okay. we need to add that we can certainly add well, that we can fix that park county so that'll be consistent would that be okay that would be perfect thank you and I just and and just I guess look at the creation of the form um, there after question number two there are areas of little dots where the patients can indicate if they have those factors and or risk and they're not after before each of the responses and then also um, on I have received a blood transfusion or organ transplant prior to July 1992. You do not give them an opportunity to put a yes, no, not sure. That's missing. Okay. Uh, after the after those. Okay. Well, I can work with Kathy to make those those tweaks, and we'll send those those uh, that we revise those revisions out to everybody. Okay. Thank you uh -huh. so much. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or um, questions? We appreciate your time and um, you know you can email me at kathyj.sanders if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you Kathy for all your hard work on uh, viral hepatitis. Next we have Nancy Hamilton with the immunization program. I think we've got several changes for immunizations. And so uh, thank you, Nancy, for all of your help and, and pulling this all together for our local health department partners. We're going to start out with Hibrex, right? That would be perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everybody out there in local health department land. Um, I'm Nancy and I'm going to uh, talk about our updates for HIPRIX and all HIP containing um, vaccines. The, the main point that was um, changed for uh, the HIPRIX vaccines, or the HIP vaccines, I'm sorry, is that um, HIPRIX is no longer just used for the booster final dose. Of course, it, it's appropriate for primary immunizations now which is the, the main thing. Um, Hibrix, of course, is indicated for active immunizations for prevention of the uh, hip uh, disease, and it is approved for use in children six um, weeks through uh, four years, and that's up to their fifth birthday. It's administered, Hibrix is a four-dose series, and it can be used for all doses, including the primary uh, course of three doses and a booster at 15 to 18 months. There is a package insert for Hibrix, and it has an actual visual uh, learning tool for instructions on how to mix the uh, dosage, and you have to reconstitute with the actual uh, 
uh, vial that is included with the Hibrix uh, vaccine. If you, st if you reconstitute and do not use, you need to store it between 36 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit, and you have to administer within 24 hours. Um, if the vaccine is not used immediately, you'll need to um, shake it up to reconstitute it. Of course, as a nurse, I don't um, recommend doing, uh, fixing a vaccine, reconstituting a vaccine, and putting it back in the refrigerator. I would hope that you would use it um, as soon as you uh, reconstitute it. Okay. Um, the, uh, if you reconstitute and then have to shake it, leave it for a while and then have to shake it up. If you notice that there's any particulate matter or if there if it's cloudy, you need to uh, waste that dose and make another one. We don't want to take any chances on there being a problem with the immunization. Okay. And as I said, the licensed, <clears throat> excuse me, monovalent hip conjugate vaccines are considered interchangeable for the primary as well as booster doses. And that'll be a three dose or a four dose series, depending on uh, which vac type of vaccine you're using. So, the, and one of the other things that they have um, discussed and put on the uh, package insert is that apnea has sometimes been discovered uh, following IM vaccinations on infants that have been born prematurely. So in order to make a decision about whether to administer the vaccine for a premature infant, you, um, you need to base it on the consideration of the individual infant's medical status and, in the, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and the potential benefits and the possible risk of the vaccines. And you'll have to uh, debate those and see which one is, will, is, is more better for the baby. Protect, protect that Hibrix from light, and if you have any questions at all, you can contact me on the Hibrix. Do you all have any questions about Hibrix, the Hib containing vaccines? Okay, we're going to move on to the Comvax. And the update for the Comvax, um, it's a six weeks minimum interval between dose one and dose two. And dose three, as the booster dose of Comvax, is recommended at age 12 through 15 months. ACIP recommends that that dosage be given with a one uh, given by IM uh, with a one to two inch length needle. And there's a site that you can go to that will tell you the different lengths of needles that will be needed for the different immunizations and where they uh, should be on the body. So I included that for your reference. Um, it is a licensed, licensed model, as I said before, licensed monovalent hip conjugate vaccines. They're considered interchangeable. Uh, Comvax is not interchangeable. And again, there's the uh, MMWR as to where you can go and reference that information. Again, another uh, the same contraindication for apnea. If you have a premature infant that needs a Comvax, then you need to weigh the pros and cons of what the infant's situation is against um, the benefits of the vaccine. The, one of the other um, additions to Comvax for the contraindications, it, it used to have acute or severe and now it is added moderate with or without fever. An acute, moderate, or severe illness with or without fever is a contraindication. If you all have any questions on that, feel free to call me or if you have any questions now. Then we'll move on to the pentacell shortage, which should be getting better right now, but I think we still have. Can you do HPV? That's okay. Oh, you want to do HPV? Why, well, sure, that's fine. But somebody wants me. Okay, we will do the um, protocol for the nonvalent HPV. 
the big change on this is not an actual change for us. The big change is when um, FDA recommended the approval for 9V HPV in males 16 to, through 26, stating that it's no longer um, off, um, considered off-label, but we were already allowing that to happen anyway. But 9V HPV is a routine vaccination for um, 11 to 12 year olds. It can start as early as nine. Uh, for females, it goes nine to 26 years, and for males, um, now goes to 26 years, if nine to 21 years, if not vaccinated previously. But the FDA has approved that for males 16 to 26, so it's no longer off label. Um, it is also recommended through age 26 for men who have sex with men and immunocompromised persons. Any questions about that? Missy, Missy Eastman is really the guru for um, HPV, but you can contact me and, and if I don't know, I can always ask her. Okay. Now we're going to do the 2016 Pentacell shortage, which 2016 is almost so hopefully they are um, we don't we have not heard any word yet but we are hoping that the shortage will soon be over but there is no shortage of daptacel active and, and apple so you can you can use those single antigens to fill in for the pentacel you would continue to follow the um, recommended schedule and ensure that the patients receive all recommended um, individual immunizations from that the Pentacel includes by using the single antigen. And if you are a VFC provider, if you have any questions about the schedule or how you should order these vaccines that you need, you need to contact your um, VAST person, whether it be um, uh, Clarissa or Jane which or Rita which I think would all be for Rita would all be yours okay um, again you just want to use the single antigens they're pushing that make sure you get the um, correct antigens in that that they need for Pentacel and I know parents probably don't want their children having an extra immunization but during this shortage time, that's the only way that we can get them correctly immunized. Be careful when you use other combo vaccines and single antigens because you want to stay on the correct schedule. And you want to, uh, Pentacel, of course, is a four-dose schedule, but you want to make sure whatever you're using, whatever that schedule is, is the one that you continue to use and be cautious of the intervals between the vaccines. Um, ACIP recommends using the same brand of immunizations and not intermix the brand names. So if you choose Santa Fe or GSK or Merck, stick with whatever is in there, um, uh, whatever you, you get from them, continue with that same vaccine. Um, if you absolutely do not know what was used first, you can interchange the vaccines, but stick with the one that you use next. Um, I think we talked about this, about the HIV. Uh, the, I gave you a, a schedule, um, a web link that you could look up and see what the different vaccines that you could use and also in the same um, web link there is um, a schedule that will tell you if you start with Pentacel and then you run and then you don't have any more Pentacel what you can use and um, what brands will fill in for the different age groups and that should be in your um, 
actual, uh, I'm sorry, the, the PowerPoint full version that we sent. So it will have those. And so do you all have any questions? This is Jennifer with Bracken County. Um, PDRX is readily available, though, if you do want to order that instead of Penticill, correct? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. If you have any questions, and, if, and I'm, I might always kind of put a little ad out there. Um, I'm also the nurse for the registry. So if you have any questions about immunizations from the registry, just contact me also and I'll be happy to help you. And call me for anything, and if I can't help you, I can always find someone that can help you. Thank you all. Thank you, Joy. Yep. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. Next, we'll have Trina Miller, who is our prenatal program coordinator, come up and talk to us about the prenatal program positions. I think um, if are you prepared or would you mind just talk about the um, safe sleep brochures as well or can I or I can talk about that if you don't have that information. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. What about the PN2? Could you mention that? Yes. Okay, yes. all right, thank you. Appreciate it, Trina. Good morning. My name is Trina Miller and I'm our prenatal program coordinator. And I'll just uh, the revisions are, are minor, um, so I'll go over those. Um, of course, the table of contents is renumbered accordingly to the changes that um, have occurred in the CCSG. On page three, um, regarding the prenatal vitamins, the word not um, was added to the sentence. Um, somehow that word was not in their pro was not in their prior, the word not. Um, so it should read, if a prenatal vitamin supplement will not which is the addition, meet all the guidelines established by the DRI, it is best to recommend a vitamin that would fall between the minimum and maximum levels and is approved by the prenatal provider. I know often we have some questions regarding uh, finding just that right uh, prenatal um, vitamin. And so just uh, looking at the matrix that's there and there is some guidance on that, but that's the only change is just having that word not be added. Then on page four, we added the following reference is um, the ACOG committee opinion number 548, which is weight gain during pregnancy. And that is the ACOG um, committee opinion where some of that information that's in the CCSG came from. With all, all our information, we want to uh, have ACOG based. So we just added some of those references for some supplemental material. On page 10, the sentence was there, but it was just revised for a flow of, of language. Um, we added the reference update on carrier screen for cystic fibrosis committee opinion number 486. And that information to locate that article is there. On page 11, we added the following sentence that was revised. It says screening is generally performed at the 24 to 28 prenatal week prenatal visit, but early screening is recommended in women with risk factors. And so the portion that was revised or added was um, early screening is recommended with risk factors. And that is um, referenced actually with the page 13 that we added is the ACOG gestational diabetes fact sheet 177. So um, that was the revisions and additions regarding the gestational diabetes. Are there any questions regarding that? And then I'll mention the PN2. Okay, the PN2 is a uh, pregnancy risk behavior screening form that we have had in the CCSG for, for many years prior to myself being here. And so there has been some updated information on that for the contact for Katie Stratton. And so um, we realized that wasn't in our form section, so we did put that back into our form section. And we would um, like, particularly if you are seeing prenatal patients in the health department, 
to be sure to utilize that form. We want to be sure that we are screening for substance use, smoking, drugs, domestic violence, um, and those items. And that PN2 form is inclusive of some questions regarding those items. On there is your substance or your Kids Now Plus program contact information. And also within the form section of the CCSG is their brochure and flyer. And so we would just recommend working with your Kids Now Plus um, staff and to utilize that form even if you have patients that come in that you may not do a full prenatal uh, workup with and far as far as uh, OB doctor being at the health department but you may do some labs or you may do some um, services for the prenatal patient would still suggest um, utilizing that form and asking those questions regarding um, drug substance and um, the domestic violence intimate partner so any further questions? If I can be of any help or assistance, please feel free to email, call, or contact me. And thank you for all you do. Yes. Hi. Hi, Trina. This is Moni Shields at Fayette County. Hello. And I have a question. Hi. I have a question about the, the PM2. Um, you know, we refer out for prenatal care. Yes. When the only thing we do is that initial visit for pregnancy and we do do an informational packet. Is this risk assessment something that needs to be done on that initial visit or is this something that the OB provider would pursue? Um, probably more than likely the OB provider isn't probably utilizing this particular form. Per ACOG, right. and their, um, their forms they use, they address those topics. With um, Within seeing patients for your family planning visit and they have a positive pregnancy test, you would follow that family planning matrix and so I would just would follow your family planning matrix, what they have listed there. If for some reason um, the patient comes back in for some other services or, or you would see the patient for some other reason, um, then would, would use that PN2 form. If um, I, I would think, if I recall, in the family planning, they do something where they do address those items. If for some reason uh, substance abuse, um, domestic violence isn't addressed during a uh, that positive pregnancy test visit, then I would go ahead and utilize that. But I think those items are addressed. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Trina. Next we have Susan Lawson, who is the well child and school health and EPSCT and lead program coordinators. I think I got all those hats, did I? Actually, Anita has EPSCT outreach now. Oh, okay, all right. All right, well, thank you, Susan, for coming up, and you're gonna talk about the pediatric changes yes. in the CCSG. Thank you so much for being with us today. You're so welcome. Hi, I'm Susan Lawson, and like she said, I'm with the Well Child, the Lead Poisoning Prevention Program, and the school health programs. Uh, my changes are based on Kathy Sanders' uh, cha uh, addition to the Hepatitis C uh, section in the CCSG and AR. And so she had asked me to add these to our um, matrix and to our uh, Well Child program uh, guidelines. So on page one on that matrix, I've added for the patient at risk the quantitative Hepatitis C RNA to do those at two and four months. And then the, the guidance on that is on page two. And it talks about that a comprehensive history should be completed on the initial visit uh, for one of the factors is hepatitis B and hepatitis C status. And then if they are positive for that, that the child should be um, at ages two and four months be provided with that uh, immunization. Um, if you have any questions on that, you can contact me. Um, I would probably get with Sandy or Kathy Sanders and talk with her on your question and then provide a response and CC her on it because she is the expert on the hepatitis C. Uh, she just asked, asked me to add these to the matrix. Um, I'll read this on page two. I mean, you'll have that on, on the PowerPoint and, and if you printed it off. For infants born to mothers confirmed to be infected with hepatitis C virus, 
uh, provide a quantitative HCV RNA testing at ages two and four months and provide age-appropriate age immunizations, including hepatitis B immunization. Uh, quantitative HCV RNA testing should be repeated at a subsequent visit in four to six months from whenever you did it, uh, independent of the initial HCV RNA test result if the first test is reported as negative. An antibody HCV test can be an alternative alternative but should be provided no sooner than 18 months uh, because the anti-HCV from the mother can interfere with the test results at that age. So Kathy has uh, stressed to, to wait for that. Um, again, see the Kathy's five screening and referral guidance um, on that. On page two, um, on that number six at the bottom of that, I added for infants born to mothers confirmed to be infected with HCV, provide age-appropriate immunizations, including the hepatitis B vaccine. Okay, on page three, we're going to the 18-month matrix. Again, I've added for the 18 months to do the hepatitis C antibody test, and that is for the at-risk patient. And same thing. Um, on page four for that uh, comprehensive history to include um, asking about the hepatitis B and the hepatitis C set status. And then I added uh, at the bottom of that paragraph, for infants born to mothers confirmed to be infected with hepatitis C virus, uh, provide a quantitative HCV RNA testing at age two, four months and provide it's the same information, but going down to the 18 months. An anti-HCV antibody test can be an alternative, but should be provided no sooner than 18 months. So you need to wait to the 18 months and, and after them. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, just email me on that. And then Dr. Brawley um, asked on page four and on page six, where it had uh, listed the PPD for the tuberculin test. Uh, it has changed to the TST, which is the tuberculin skin test. So that's what we added. Uh, we changed that and it should be administered to at-risk children with any of the high-risk indicators on the tuberculin skin test recommendations. And see the TB section for that information. And that's all I have. Is there any questions on that section? Again, this is new, so I mean, any questions we will work through Kathy and uh, get them clarified with any corrections. Okay. This is Amy at Bracken. Is, has the hepatitis C testing been communicated to the physicians? Is this something required by Medicaid? That I don't know. This is just through Kathy's program and because it's a DPH program she's asked us to add this to our grid. Amy, I believe that's a, a, CC, a CDC recommendation that was in the hepatitis C MMWR. Well, we, so the doctors the doctors are aware that they're supposed to be doing that testing. That should that should be a standard of care. But what I'll do, yeah, what that is a standard of care from the CDC. So let me uh, confirm that with Kathy, and we'll send that note out to you all to confirm that. Okay. And and there may be a, a time period Thanks. that the that working. I mean, I'm still having problems with healthcare providers doing the lead test uh, for at risk patients. So I mean, this is going to be a, a a time period where you can be a liaison to educate on what the hepatitis um, C you know, recommendations, what the hepatitis C program and CDC has recommended. Um, I know they're not always apt to listen, but uh, be a, a person out there giving that information. So any other questions? Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And there certainly is a, a learning curve there with our physician partners to yes. get those uh, standards of care out. So uh, I'll get with Kathy on, on the confirmation of that of those guidelines. Next, we have Jam Wright, who is with our newborn screening program. Had some great emails with you, Jan, here recently. So thanks for coming and being with us today. You have a few uh, brief changes that you wanted to make to the newborn screening program chapter, right? Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Joyce said, I'm Jan Bright, and I'm the nurse administrator for the newborn screening program. Our changes to the CCSG are very, very brief. 
um, the phone number over at the lab. They have a couple additional numbers that are added. So if you look at their website, there is a number there. I would encourage if you use that number, don't use the extension, just wait for the operator to move you through that system. The other numbers are listed on your slide for them. Um, the other change that we did was just a changing in the organization of the process. When a child has their newborn screening completed, the initial results will be sent to the primary care physician by the Division of Lab Services. If you're not getting that, you're seeing a child, you need a copy of those labs, please just give us a call. We'll help try to expedite research and get you what you need. Um, the second thing to this process is if a child needs a repeat set of labs or a repeat newborn screening, and sometimes we find that um, maybe the sample was insufficient done at the hospital, but the child's been discharged and now they're coming to you to get their repeat labs. So if that happens, you know, um, again, you can call us, we can help walk you through the system, but the letter for that need for a repeat will most likely come from my program, which is the follow-up program. Any lab results you get will need to be faxed to us at the follow-up program. And um, I guess the only other two things to say is we're very excited. Our program has grown. We've added four new disorders and within the past year. We've added the um, Pompeii disorder, the severe combined immunodeficiency disorder, which most people commonly known as the bubble boy or skid, um, crab A, and Yuko polysaccharidosis type 1 or NPS1. Um, because of those increase of things, we also had to make changes to needs for equipment and whatnot. So our fees did increase for this initial screening. Repeat screenings, are, there is no charge. And then finally, to sum up, how do you get a hold of us for all those things I said you can call us for? Well, my teammates and I are listed on your screen. As I said, I'm Jan Bright and Mary Sue Flora. She is wonderful. She does our metabolic foods and formula program for the children who have metabolic needs for specialty formulas and then we have Angie Brown um, and she follows up on our kids who have critical congenital heart disease disorders. Our telephone number is listed. The website listed there is where you can get our newborn screening brochure. More information about the 52 disorders that we screen for and as I've said before, Kentucky's newborns, their future's so bright, they just gotta wear shades. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate you, you coming in. It's nice to have you on board and nice to, great to work with you and you. your team. Just a few wrap-up uh, comments. We're running a few minutes early, so that's good. Um, wanted to let you all know, remind you all that as a uh, part of the attachments that I sent out to everyone on Monday afternoon, the signature page uh, was attached, so go ahead. Um, after you've got your materials together and your protocol changes for your uh, medical director, uh, go ahead and obtain those, those signatures, complete your staff trainings. Uh, I know lo some local health departments still print out hard copies of the CCSG, that's fine, but the electronic versions of the CCSG, Casey Courtney will be working to have all those posted um, and in place on the uh, online on our uh, DPH local health operations website page uh, no later than July 1st so those will be the uh, the, the deadline for uh, the implementation of these new CCSG protocols and as I mentioned I will have the, the intranasal protocol to you for the naloxone to you no later than today also a part of what I sent out uh, what, along with the signature page is the updated contact list for the DPH program staff so if you have questions and for some reason you don't have their, didn't get their phone number from today's presentations you can use that list uh, for the CCSG changes or for future questions that you might have about the programs. There were also two safe sleep documents uh, that were revised and updated that will be added to the teaching sheet, sheet section of the CCSG. So um, when you have a, a new mom that comes in and, or a soon to deliver uh, mom and you want to do, you're doing some education or maybe through your hands program or prenatal program or well child, you can share the information about safe sleep practices and use those 
guidance documents as your patient teaching sheets. So those will be posted for you as well. Um, as Trina Miller mentioned, we'll have the uh, prenatal, the P and 2 form, uh, also the updated form also included in the, the form section. Just a quick review of what I have on my uh, to-do list, on my follow-up list for you all. Questions that were raised during the, the presentation today that I'll follow up on is the, um, the lab packaging and shipping uh, trainings. I'll follow up on the status of those where we are so we can uh, provide that information to uh, all of our local health department partners. Um, the, there, you all had requested a list of the changes for the forms for the family planning teaching sheets and someone mentioned that the um, teaching sheet form numbers had inadvertently been deleted so we'll make sure those get added back on there from what we sent out on Monday. The STD program is looking at uh, some of those the new meds uh, as to whether or not they'll be able to cover those under the new protocols as written if they'll be able to provide those to local health departments so I'll send a note to uh, Sherry as just as a follow-up on that request. Um, the HCV forms, uh, uh, I've asked the local health department, uh, Clark County, to send us those changes so Kathy Sanders can look at those for her review and consideration to include those. And of course, if uh, any revisions were made, we'll be sure to get those out to you all right away. Wanted to also I'll follow up with Kathy Sanders on the hepatitis C for um, infants and do the physicians in the communities know about that change in the standard of care for testing for hepatitis C. So I'll follow up with her on that guidance and I'll be sure to share that with you all. Do you all have any questions or comments or concerns for me at this time? Thanks again for, uh, to you all for all that you do. I uh, four emails with uh, a lot, of, you know, a lot of many attachments. So I know that there's a lot of uh, work that goes into uh, the review and, and training and the implementation of the of the new guidelines. So I appreciate you all uh, so much. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact the program directors or feel free to contact me and I can route your, your question to the appropriate person. Or if you have any questions about the CCSG in general, uh, medical director signature, please feel free to let me know those questions. Thank you so much, have a great day.